Buddhists, God Etermidag, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today in Nornos Kunstmuseum, Dabi Norga Daida Museum. And we're launching today a new public program called The Butterfly Effect. It's partially digital, partially physical series, including talks, panel discussions, workshops, performances, walks, gatherings, and food sharing moments. And it's going to last 18 months. We're going to be convening the voices of thinkers, artists, curators from different parts of the world to shed light on concrete experiences, past, present, and of the speculative future, with regards to the role of museums in society. With one simple question, can small shifts in museums generate seismic change in our societies? That museums of today face profound challenges is without doubt, and a symptom of the urgent and interconnected impact upon our societies of the climate emergency, of racial and sexual exploitation, wealth inequality, and technological innovation which is outpacing human comprehension. Yet museums have a role to play in activating solutions to these challenges. As systems in and of themselves, museums reflect and reinforce the societal structures in which they exist. And since their onset in the 18th century, modern museums have been central to the modernist and colonial project. But a more expansive history of museums and cultural institutions can also reveal a host of anti-modernist, anti-colonial critique and find examples of alternative radical museologies and institutional practices that can empower us to activate change. In Nornos Kunstmuseum, we recognize that museums are sites of ideology and thus repositories of vested interests. And we acknowledge their foundations upon extractive and racialized mechanisms. And yet, we also believe it is possible to counter these armatures by positioning ourselves as parts of mutable structures in constant flux that foster polyphonic voices and challenge received histories. At Nornos Kunstmuseum, we thus endeavor to work through situated practices that understand their local beingness as an indisputable part of the many interconnected worldviews that exist around us and beyond us. And furthermore, we advocate for museums of intervention and criticality, museums that inform state policy rather than be harnessed by it. So with the Butterfly Effect series, we hope to strengthen and to celebrate the museum's responsibility and potential in society. We also hope to nourish and to accelerate our own internal commitment to and implementation of the repurposing of our resources to generate processes of transformation that are urgent and crucial to our planetary longevity. The butterfly effect convenes the following speakers, Ema Josephine Budge, Leuli Eshragi, Anawana Haloba, Stephanie Hessler, Candice Hopkins, Melanie Keane, Kimberly Moulton, Manuela Moscoso, and a zombie, and many more to be announced soon. And launching the series today is a very special guest, Laura Rajkovic. Laura is a New York City-based writer and curator. Her recent book, Culture Strike, Art and Museums in the Age of Protest was published in 2021 by Verso Books, and we have some copies in our bookshop at a special discounted rate today. Laura is also editor and curator of Proto Dispatch, a digital publication initiated with Mari Spirito and Proto Cinema in 2022, featuring artists' takes on the local and global conditions 
that make their work necessary. And with a collective of artists, musicians, and culture workers, this year, Lauda opened the Francis Kite Club, a bar, cultural, activist space in New York City's East Village. Prior to these projects, Lauda served as director of the Queen's Museum, interim director of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. She was a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow at the Bellagio Center, and the Tremaine Curatorial Fellow for Journalism at Hyperallergic. I would like to thank all team members in the museum who have played a role in making this series possible, and especially to my colleagues Liv Brisak and Oliver Graney, with whom I've been developing this program. And also thanks to the Norwegian General Consulate in New York for supporting Laura's travels. And now, without any further ado, Please join me to give a most heartfelt welcome to our guest speaker today, the fabulous Laura Rajkovic. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it is truly delightful to be here in Romso, Tromso. I've never been up north before in Norway, and so it's been a special treat to visit with you all. Um, before I begin, I just want to uh, acknowledge the land on which we are sitting today uh, together, talking and hopefully thinking together through some of the really important ideas that uh, Katya and her team have brought forward through this series. Um, the Sami have cared for this land since time immemorial, and I just want to acknowledge um, my respect and, uh, and privilege of being here, uh, and also to acknowledge the land that I live on uh, in uh, Manhattan, or Manhattan, um, that have been cared for by the Lenape people, um, to whom I also owe a debt of great gratitude for preserving the land in, on which I am able to live and work. And also thank Katya, and Liv and Oliver for bringing me here and the whole team um, here at the museum. I'm very grateful to be here and to have this ongoing conversation hopefully with you all. I would love this to be more of an exchange than a lecture, so I'm going to make a few proposals through my talk and then I hope we can have a robust conversation thereafter. I'm going to start today uh, with an unusual coincidence uh, that parallels a lot of my thinking and belief in coincidences not only in the present, but coincidences of history. And um, I say this because when Katya emailed me about the butterfly effect, um, I, I couldn't quite believe that that was the name of the series, because in fact I had studied and done a great deal of research on the butterfly effect in my, uh, uh, for my book about, uh, it's really a, a, a lyric essay about the lightning field, which is a artwork by Walter De Maria that's in the high desert in, um, in, in New Mexico in the United States. And this book is really a meditation on uh, multiple visits to the field itself, which is a mile by kilometer grid of stainless steel poles. As you can see in this image, you see basically a, a line of poles uh, reaching into the distance. This is, uh, this photo was probably taken in the spring. It doesn't normally look this lush. Uh, the desert is uh, very dry, um, but in the springtime it does flower. Um, in any case, uh, I just thought it was a remarkable coincidence, and um, and I'm going to read a segment of uh, the essay because it kind of describes uh, the butterfly effect, um, and and it's a point of departure for my talk. So, um, chaos and coincidences of history. Edward Lawrence was a meteorologist at MIT in the early 1960s. Looking for a devil in the detail of meteorological data, he was trying to forecast global weather patterns, creating forecasting models that would later be applied to economics and financial analysis. Complicated, complicated sets of equations, sometimes arbitrary webs of information, measurements of initial conditions. Churned, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to advance the slides here. Sorry, you're supposed to be seeing this. Okay. 
complicated sets of equations, sometimes arbitrary webs of information, measurements of initial conditions, churned through a primitive computer, the machine was named the Royal McBee. During one of his sessions in the winter of 1961, Lawrence found that a very small and previously considered statistically insignificant variation in the initial input of data produced extremely diverse and unpredictable outcomes. His data mapped butterfly shapes, showing that cascades of small quirks in analysis over time produced wildly different predictions. The results revealed vast inaccuracies in any long-range forecast. Lawrence identified a, quote, sensitive dependence on initial conditions, a dependence that required st the stability of initial data without which the forecast would be unpredictable. He invented the Lorenz attractor. Can I? Huh. He invented the Lorenz attractor, a butterfly shaped diagram, a series of loops hovering over a three dimensional axis. At each point that made up the curve of the loops represented data that, over the course of the model's run, absorbed errors memories, inaccuracies. The butterfly maps a repeating pattern that, due to small perturbations within the system, is aperiodic. Lauren's butterflies depict incidents of chaotic patterning. The patterns reveal something about scale and the relationship between the very large and the very small. He identified these patterns by looking carefully at weather, but they were not new. Ideas of this kind had existed since well before the 19th century. Lawrence Butterfly made others also look more closely at these phenomena. Stumbling on Lawrence, I thought, perhaps it is a coincidence of history. A year before Lawrence examined weather patterns and identified his butterfly-shaped diagrams as indicators of chaos, Walter de Maria wrote on the importance of natural disasters. He wrote, I think natural disasters have been looked upon in the wrong way. Newspapers always say they are bad, a shame. I like natural disasters, and I think that they may be the highest form of art possible to experience. For one thing, they are impersonal. I don't think art can stand up to nature. Put the best object you know next to the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, the Redwoods. The big things always win. Now, just think of a flood, a forest fire, a tornado, an earthquake, a typhoon, a sandstorm. Think of the breaking of the ice jams. Crunch. If all of the people who go to museums could just feel an earthquake, not to mention the sky and the ocean. But it is the unpredictable disasters that the, but it is in the unpredictable disasters that the highest forms are realized. They are rare and we should be thankful for them. A curve in the shape of a butterfly can describe the future as a forecast. This forecast, Lawrence showed, may not be accurate. The curve can also describe the past as accumulations of experience. I remembered Nabokov and his butterflies. So I wanted to start there because um, I think this idea of making small changes in initial conditions, in the conditions that exist around us, uh, or even in the initial conditions, as Katya described, of the, the, the settler colonial and, um, and um, uh, oppressive roots of the structures of the museum can actually have an impact, perhaps, on the way that they uh, function today. So these are the key questions that I want to focus on. What does it mean to have a, a sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and how can we imagine the future as a forecast? So the question that, uh, that the museum is asking by using the butterfly effect as the name of this program is whether small changes within museums today can impact futures on a societal scale in the future. And this is also the core question that I have con been contemplating for a very, very long time. And so I want to talk a little bit about why I wrote the Culture Strike book, um, because I think these were my initial conditions, kind of walking into this exploration. Um, so for me, it was very important to consider 
neutrality, um, you know, as a myth within cultural space. A as Katya noted, you know, museums don't come out of this neutral nothingness. They come out of a set of biases that are socially and culturally constructed within society. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to write about the museum, other than that's the space that I know very well, um, is also because um, museums have become the perfect mirror of society. In a sense, it's a miniaturized version of all of uh, the challenges that society faces writ large. And so in a way, I imagined the possibility for um, potential change, being able to, the, how, how wonderful it would it be if we could locate spa uh, the cultural space as a space where we could find ways, uh, levers to use to change these conditions and therefore then be able to apply them uh, perhaps in society at large. Um, and then I also was really thinking a lot about my experiences of working inside culture for over 20 years and understanding that um, that in the denial of these circumstances uh, as reality of, of museums not being neutral and of the necessity of, of counterbalancing uh, the kind of stories that we are told uh, largely in, in cultural space and in, in by societal racists and, uh, and uh, um, uh, capitalist uh, societal structures, the stories that get told are the ones that uh, reinforce the status quo and that reinforce uh, the, the powerful and the wealthy. And so in order to, if we were even to dream of making a radical change uh, to those stories or to the ways in which uh, they are imposed upon us as people, um, we would have to recognize that these things were uh, were present before um, even being able to imagine that change. Um, and it is our imagination, I believe, that is being narrowed by these forces of what is possible and what is, um, what is in a sense, uh, who we can be as a people, uh, as a people together. And I think that the, 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 the categorization that uh, modernism has wrought has siloed us from one another and from the ways in which culture is actually completely imbricated into life. We all produce culture every day, whether or not we consider ourselves artists. And, um, and these divisions that are actually uh, embodied within cultural spaces, by and large, um, due to their desires to categorize and make uh, separate from one another, the different uh, kinds of a cultural production that we make, or even what qualifies as high culture um, that is uh, deserving of a place inside of a museum. So all of these things for me are very important in sort of considering how we can expand our imaginations around what is possible, how we want to live together, how we want to be, because culture, after all, is not a painting on a wall. It's who we are in time and space. So I learned a lot from re writing the book, um, and it's funny because, um, you know, I think I say in the book many things which are very, very obvious, but I also felt like needed to just be said in one place. Um, and um, so the, the book itself walks through a number of recent examples of uh, different crises within the world of art and culture. Uh, it, it's mostly focused on stuff that happens in New York City because that's where I live and that's what I know the best. Um, and so I recognize that it has, but, but I also think that, so it has its limitations uh, geographically speaking, but I also think that a lot of the things that have happened in New York over the last several years are very indicative of what's happening elsewhere and have a deep and profound relationship to that. So I learned a number of things that, um, here I think I have another slide here. Uh, yeah, right, sorry, I already talked about it. So this is what I learned. Um, I learned um, some very important things about, um, about how, or I, I thought more deeply and, and, and really learned a great deal from writing the book, but these four things are really important to me. And the first one is that change must happen around not only what is programmed, but how. Um, and what I mean is this, um, you know, the, the the selection of whose art and what art um, ends up 
on a museum's walls or in its galleries is, of course, a, a very logical place to begin. However, it is the processes of how that art is selected, who is making those selections, and how uh, the, those institutions are run that is really important. And so I am going to bring in an example here of, um, well, uh, yeah, I'll bring in an example here. This is a project that I embarked on actually in the midst of the pandemic with the Brooklyn Public Library. It's called the Art and Society Census. And it was an attempt to understand, uh, because we have no cultural ministry at the federal national level in the United States, there is no national cultural policy to speak of. Uh, I mean, well, that's somewhat debatable, but, um, there is no federal cultural ministry. There is no federal body that uh, looks at culture writ large in the United States. It's just not part of the DNA of the government. Um, there is the National Endowment for the Arts, which was seen as basically a funding body for a very uh, insignificant, frankly, amount of funding, which is always embattled and always a problem. So. Um, we do not have a kind of national conversation, as it were, about culture and uh, what it includes, who it, uh, you know, how it is uh, produced, et cetera. And so our thought was to say, okay, well, let's take a census at least of people living in New York, regular people who, um, to find out what they are interested in and what, um, and, and how they might think about culture as it currently exists, the cultural institutions that we have, um, and to really take a look at that. Um, and so we eventually, we, we created several working groups. We, we did a, a, a survey of, se I think it was 1,700 people responded to the survey. And from that survey uh, with several uh, wonderful facilitators, we sort of picked out the threads that were the most uh, active considerations of members of the public. And it was important for me to work with the public library because in a sense, the, the, it's the closest thing that we have in the United States as a, a, I think it's one of the most democratic institutions that we have in the United States, in spite of the fact that it's largely funded in similar structures that the, um, that museums are. Somehow because it retains this kind of publicness and because there are libraries, uh, community libraries all over the United States and embedded into different neighborhoods and oftentimes serve as places for kids to go after school if their parents are working, you know, to do their homework or hang out or participate in programs. It's, and it's place in New York City and I'm sure many other places where, you know, homeless people can go and spend the day warm and reading the newspaper and reading books uh, and engaging with the staff there. So. These are democratic spaces in ways that I think museums aren't, and I also write in the book about how there is something that in the U.S. we can learn um, in, in museum spaces from, from our public libraries. But the Brooklyn Public Library is a vast, vast system. Uh, most people live within a mile, of, uh, within a, mile of, a, of a branch of the public library. And so before the pandemic hit, we were actually going to hold these workshops in local library branches so people could come together and be together in person to hold these discussions, but um, but then we obviously shifted um, online when 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 we had to isolate from one another, and so um, essentially um, the 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 groups met around several key uh, conversations, um, and there's a really uh, wonderful if you if you just you can Google uh, Art and Society Census. Brooklyn Public Library, and you'll see this very beautiful um, um, uh, document, uh, the part of which I, I, I showed there, that actually delineates all of the different uh, working groups and their recommendations. And really key questions emerged around funding, around um, whose art and what art, um, really interesting conversations around um, uh, where the funding comes from and, um, and also uh, what the interface is with the public and whose expertise is on view. Um, and one of the things that I really got out of this, which, had, which is also somewhat addressed in the book, uh, or is addressed in the book, um, but obviously bears further consideration, because I think it's one of the really key pieces, is that museums are, in the United States especially, but I think also here um, in Europe, they, they take um, an educational view of their work, which is not 
incorrect. It's just a question of how communication is then considered with publics. And I think that by and large, the, um, the assumption is that we as museum workers are experts and the public uh, does not know some essential thing that we have to share with them. Um, and so we broadcast our own expertise in a way that is um, meant to be educational. But I think we lose out uh, on something really enormous here in this, um, in this non-exchange, in this broadcasting. And by switching to a much more exchange-oriented system of discourse with our publics, we can not only respect and elevate that our publics come in with just as much knowledge as we do, but also find ways for uh, an exchange that might actually illuminate many of the uh, practices and uh, never mind the objects uh, within museums and within collections. And I think that that, uh, you know, that you know, at first when you say, and many education departments, of course, have been using these kinds of techniques for a long time, but that n has not necessarily translated into um, kind of the whole um, pedagogical infrastructure of the museum. And so um, what I've been obsessed with in coming out of uh, the, the, the learnings that I made uh, during this kind of contemplation of the uh, of, of culture strike um, was that um, essentially the uh, the public the infrastructure of culture has to be radically changed um, and um, we must do that through a variety of means and and these dovetail with the learnings that I had one is that uh, obviously change must happen in what is programmed as well as how and that that operational change must be central to the um, uh, to the paradigm shift, um, and and another example of what uh, sorry I yeah another example of how this might work is actually embodied by a wonderful project that several students at Brown University, uh, an artist and a journalism student, conducted at the RISD uh, Art Museum, called Look at Art Get Paid, and so. Um, one of the ways this project uh, functioned was that they actually, um, the RISD Art Museum is located in the center of Providence, and there's literally a hill where Brown University and, um, and RISD are. And, you know, it's kind of like the tower on the hill, and then everybody else who lives in the city who, and they don't really seamlessly interact, let's just put it this way. Um, and uh, the city of Providence ha is just like any other city, um, you know, it has its, um, the, the people, the, the small percentage of people who are, uh, live there because of the university and then everybody else who's, who has the same kinds of, um, you know, ranges in um, economic uh, situation and uh, social status. And so there are many people who live in, Riz in, in Providence who would never dream of going to the RISD Museum. They just don't even think it's a place for them. And so what, uh, what the RISD Museum and these two young women did um, was to essentially put out an open call for local experts in the neighborhoods all over Providence to come and actually have a conversation about, and basically provide a critique to the museum of how they were functioning and how they're perceived. And so I thought this was quite a brave thing for the RISD Museum to do, because you know it's hard to hear when you're, I, I know what it's like to work inside museums and it's hard to receive that criticism, but this is another thing that cultural space has to get bet at, better at is receiving critique. Um, and so they paid a, a group of local people to participate in this program where they were treated as the experts on how to present things within museums. And they actually came up with a set of protocols that allowed the museum to reconsider its presentation of things. Linguistically, what was prioritized because almost everything was uh, almost everything was exclusively in English. What other languages would be important to have within the museum? Um, what kind of translation work? Um, even down to things that were very um, kind of 
uh, I would say not obvious uh, to museum staff. So for example, you know, I mean, in any cultural institution I've ever worked, it was always a priority to have the front desk staff be extremely friendly and lovely. And at the Queen's Museum, we always had front desk staff who also spoke many different languages, uh, which was particularly important given the, uh, the cultural fabric around the Queen's Museum. Um, the borough of Queen's is the most linguistically diverse geography on the planet, <laughs> and um, there are over 36 different languages and, uh, sorry, 96 different languages and and um, um, and dialects spoken in Queens, um, and some of those languages don't even exist anymore in the place that they originated. They are uh, so-called dead languages that only now exist through speakers in Queens. So. The linguistic diversity of the place is really fascinating, um, and um, anyway, I could talk for I could talk for a long time about that. And if you have questions about it, I'd be delighted to speak to it. But um, the 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 recommendation, you know, we always really focused on the front desk staff being very friendly and open. But one of the critiques that were brought by the expert um, people in Providence was to say that. That didn't matter because actually people didn't, it wasn't legible to many people who didn't grow up going to the museums in the United States, what the protocols even were for entering a museum. Did you have to wear certain types of clothes? Did you have to pay? Did you have to, like th these sort of basic things that are not necessarily communicated easily because especially in the United States, there isn't this culture of culture of uh, this culture of um, of access to culture being free, um, that it isn't, uh, these institutions are not state run, they're private nonprofit organizations. Um, they only receive a very small amount of state or local funding. Uh, public funds are very, very limited. And so they don't feel like they belong to anyone, everyone. Um, and so people, some people are necessarily excluded from that. So pointing out these kind of very simple, simple sounding, but actually very complicated, uh, but, but, but things that actually have very complicated implications, I thought was such a beautiful part of this look at art, get paid project. So um, in any case, I, I actually interviewed uh, Maya for, for this article I wrote during my, uh, during my Tremaine Fellowship at Hyperallergic, and so you can read that's really interesting piece. Um, and so w the conclusion that I came to at the end of all of this kind of uh, rethinking was that not only was slowing down profoundly essential to how we function, um, but also really rethinking this idea about cultural infrastructure. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a few minutes. But the slowing down piece was super important because um, you know, we live in this kind of late capitalist uh, moment that is so focused on productivity and um, and deliverables um, that we don't take the time, or we are, or we're, we're basically told by this narrowed societal imagination that executive decisions are important and wonderful, and that anything that is um, you know, done by committee, like, you know, there's this phrase like decisions by committee are like an awful thing, uh, you know, or that um, a group decision is going to necessarily be a, you know, a worse decision than an executive one that I think actually needs to be completely turned inside out because um, it is clearly better, and this is kind of one of the points of, th of uh, thinking about uh, diversity and inclusion, you know, which are buzzwords right now, but can't be real until we really rethink what diversity and inclusion actually mean. And what it actually means to me is that you have a diversity of life experience in the room when decisions are taken. And it's not about, you know, a single person, me as a museum director saying, I know, yes, wonderful, thank you for your input, I'm deciding X, because that is a bad decision. <laughs> it's going to be a bad decision. No matter how equitable a person I want to be, it is ultimately coming out of my interpretation and analysis of these ideas. And so I, I firmly believe that in slowing down, we can make decisions together, because one of the reasons that that 
is the common mode is because it is fast. And being fast is highly, highly, highly valued in the society, and we need to change that. We need to become slower. How do we become slower? We include more people in the decision-making process. We reconsider who the stakeholders are. We understand one another. We begin to listen more and talk less. So, um, and we have to do that through supporting cultural infrastructure. And one of the things that both the Art and Society Census made clear, but also my uh, writing of the book, um, was that where the money comes from to create culture is actually one of the keys to making cultural infrastructure more equitable. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my discussion sort of talking about that. So cultural infrastructure to me is number one, the people within the museum. I used to say this all the time at the Queens Museum that the Queens Museum may have been a building with, with some collections, but without the people to open the door <laughs> and to put the stuff up in the galleries, we were nothing. You know, we, we were just a building and some objects. And so to me, the people are the essential part of cultural infrastructure in a way that is um, indelible and that we have to rethink uh, what institutions are based around people rather than buildings or collections. Um, the second piece is pay. How do we compensate those people for the work that they do? And in the US, because you only receive health insurance if you have a, a full-time job, essentially, uh, within that space, how do we ensure that people are cared for literally? Because, um, yeah, this is a major crisis point in the United States um, that deserves its whole, a whole other uh, set of conversations. Um, and then, of course, uh, the very basic things of heat, light, and power to keep the museum lit and operating. And then physical repairs and maintenance. So these are four very basic things that are the, the, the main requirements for having really any kind of institutional space, but for my purposes, a cultural space. So in the US, just to give you a sense, um, Less than 25% of most cultural institutions' are, uh, uh, um, uh, income comes from public sources. So, um, and this figure has been declining for over a decade, and there's no indication that it will stop. So what that means is that private sources um, of funding, private patronage, um, has become enormously powerful and um, and largely funds culture. So we're talking about private individuals, major philanthropies, like the Ford Foundation or the Mellon Foundation, these mega foundations, which of course are funded by, um, largely <coughs> by uh, extractive industries, let's just put it that way, um, uh, as well as, um, as corporations. Um, and the impacts are super profound from these sources of funds on both the way that cultural space is governed, but also uh, how it's programmed, right? Because even if we are super magnanimous about the desires of those funders, um, there is inevitably a need to reflect in some way what those funders want <laughs> to see in cultural space. And that comes attached to whole matrices of taste and, um, and um, taste and uh, cl uh, class oriented, class and racially prescribed uh, visions of taste and desire, um, which was another reason uh, right, to do the art and society census, to kind of bring these questions outside of that uh, kind of conversation. So um, it also provides for the, the possibility for very unsavory relationships to develop. Um, if you think about the Sackler family and um, how pervasive their uh, funding is of uh, US and international institutions um, while a vast majority of the family wealth comes from um, essentially creating and perpetuating the opioid crisis globally. Um, and um, 
you know, that has become very visible recently, but there are certainly many other such relationships embedded into the systems of funding culture. So um, I think this is a really important, um, what did I have next? Oh yes, okay. So th these are really important uh, threads to untangle over time. Um, and But I wanted to speak um, in relationship to the way that uh, that these things also play out in Norway, because while the s funding structures are very different, um, there are some really interesting uh, similarities in the internal conflicts of how culture comes to be uh, here as well, you know, that, that mirror kind of what's happening in the US as well. So, and please tell me if I'm getting this wrong in any way, because it's, it's just based on my readings of things, obviously. I. I'm not here. Um, so while public funding is very generous compared to the United States here in Norway, um, there is still a very profound connection between sources of funds and power. Uh, political power, economic power, all of the versions of power. And as an example, perhaps I'd like to use the the, the recent critiques of uh, the Arts Council, the, the National Arts Council strategy for omitting climate crisis from its, um, its most recent strategy as a, a primary platform for the way that culture should operate in Norway uh, in the coming times, um, and th because this seems really related. Um, and I'm thinking here about the ways that, you know, uh, private uh, and even public interest in the fossil fuel industry has funded Norway uh, to a very large degree over time, and that while there is a very public sense and impression, you know, that and I think uh, very widely held that Norway is one of the leaders in uh, clean energy development and all of this. We can't ignore the fact that Norway has been, you know, uh, 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 Norway's wealth comes from uh, the extraction of fossil fuels, um, and so um, and so there is power in the fossil fuel industry that remains from, you know, this all of this, and um, you know. Perhaps that had some influence over the, re of, you know, perhaps the, you know, um, the energy ministry had some influence over the ways in which, even if not with a with a direct, uh, you know, command, but even just, you know, uh, subtly had this influence over the way that the cultural plan or the cultural strategy was developed by. Uh, the cultural ministry, um, and and these things are not. Um, it, it, it's so obvious. I mean, I come from the United States. We are complicit as uh, American citizens through our tax payments and so much so much horribleness in the world um, that this is just something that we have to confront. Um, and so, you know, I, in the same in in a same kind of parallel way, uh, in U.S. cultural funding, um, com the funds coming from the Sacklers was, in a sense, whitewashing their participation in the op opioid crisis, um, in a way that, in a distant parallel, the omission of an explicit climate crisis prioritization within a cultural strategy might be able to whitewash the history of the Norwegian state's investment in fossil fuel extraction. Um, never mind its uh, current um, relation to uh, to those industries and and also to the green energy sectors, the problematics that have emerged over time in the green energy sector. Um, and so, in this sense, you know, which stakeholders hold the key to the money <laughs> becomes an essential question. And what can we do um, about diversifying those people's life experiences so that they're not just tied to these meta forces, um, right? And to really do an ex like a, a really deep power mapping of how those conditions actually impact what is happening inside our cultural space. Indeed, all of our spaces, but 
in my uh, analysis here in cultural space. So I feel that, you know, examining those initial conditions and recognizing them for what they are is in fact a very important first step. However, the next step is to not only analyze them, but actually do something about it. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit, before we, we get into a conversation, I want to talk about a little bit about how that can happen. And there, there are so many examples of, um, of the way that change can be made, but I do, agree, I do agree with the butterfly effect's potential as a way to kind of interrupt these narratives that are extremely problematic and that, um, that, mostly, that are mostly unseen in the way that we operate inside culture. Um, and so I'll, start, I'll, I'll just give it one example from the book, which was around uh, the Whitney Museum's, um, one of the Whitney Museum's board co-presidents, um, whose name uh, was uh, Canders. And he operated a business, believe it or not, called Safari Land. Um, and uh, which advertises uh, its ability to provide less lethal weapons. Um, and they were one of the, um, this is like a very, 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 very profitable business um, that provided um, tear gas um, and like rubber bullets and other lethal uh, weapons uh, to the Trump administration. The reason it came to light anyway was because they were providing to the Trump administration during uh, the Trump administration's, uh, you know, attempt to close the border uh, in the southern United States more dramatically. And so all of these tear gas canisters with safari land on it were found at the border. And then they were also used against Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, and they're also not coincidentally used in uh, Palestine against Palestinians. Um, so um, this all came to light sort of by chance, by, you know, it was known that he was the head of Safari Land, but one journalist from Hyperallergic wrote an article about this that was not very much paid attention to, but it existed. And actually, uh, quite a few Whitney staff members noted the article and became very concerned about it. And about 300 uh, staff members wrote a letter to the director that was not meant to be made public, but basically asking, look, you know, we see what this funding is coming from and we're having a hard time, you know, presenting to the world what we believe our mission is, which is to be open and supportive and, you know, inclusive. But we, there's a, there's a fundamental misalignment here. And so we don't know how to do it. And I, I, the letter is quite beautiful and I reprint it in full in my book because I think it's really important. And the director of the museum's response was basically like, well, it's not really your concern. Um, you know, stay in your lane. And, you know, actually Adam Weinberg, who's the director at the time, um, you know, he's somebody I've known for a million years and he's always been very supportive of me and, I, you know, I have a great deal of respect for him, but this, he, he and I have a conflict around this because I believe that that response is completely a problem um, because obviously it is completely the concern of the staff, where the funding comes from for the museum. And, you know, this was such an egregious example. But what happened next was super interesting because it wasn't this enormous sea change, right? It, there were many demands for uh, Warren Canders to resign from the board of the Whitney, and it did not happen immediately. And I think oftentimes, especially on the left, there's this kind of accusation that we're not pulling in the same direction or that we're all scattered and, you know, we're not on the same page. But actually, sometimes I think that can work to the benefit. Um, and this is one of those cases because the uh, while the, the letter was leaked to the press and a, you know, suddenly everybody knew that the staff had objected to this, these sources of funds, or some of the staff in any case, um, had rejected to this, these sources of funds, um, simultaneously decolonized this place, started a series of, um, of protests, particularly aimed at the Whitney Biennial, which is one of the most uh, attended programs that the Whitney runs. And so every Friday night during the course of the Biennial, there were protests in the lobby that were very active and um, 
um, and took place over an extended period of time, and yet still nothing happened. And I just happened, to, I mean, I know that there were, c there were conversations on the board because of course the board itself is a diverse group of people to a certain degree, and so there were certain people who thought, gee whiz, you know, maybe this guy should just resign, you know, whatever. Um, and, um, and many other people who thought he should not because they were afraid that they'd be the next target of examination of where their wealth came from, right? Um, so, um, so this was obviously a very complex situation. Um, but what I find most interesting is that this over about an eight month period, it seemed that nothing was gonna really change or happen. But then finally, um, towards the end of the biennials run, a number of artists, demanded that the Whitney withdraw their work from the exhibition. And among this group was Nicole Eisenman, who is a well-known artist and who also won the award that the Biennial gives out every two years. Um, and she had made an enormous sculpture that was installed, uh, and I'm sure it was very expensive to, to install, on one of the, the, the roof um, kind of terraces at the museum. And, um, you know, the, the Whitney Museum's conception of itself is that it's, the, it's, the, it's an artist's museum uh, because it shows the work of many, many living artists. And so this was kind of a, a big blow to its self-image, having the artists demand the withdrawal of the work from the exhibition. And it was a very successful tactic, and there had been many other attempts by artists to kind of draw attention to this uh, this asymmetry between the funding, but it, it, it didn't tip the scales yet. and. Um, I thought this was a very ex interesting example because even while all of these different protests and uh, were happening, um, some of them were much more visible than others and, and they seemed at times to be working across purposes and not everything was coordinated, right? But in point of fact, it succeeded. And so to me, this is very hopeful and, and also relates to the initial conditions of the that the butterfly effect might create, which is that, here we, here we were with a, a person who ran a very problematic in this industry, made money from a very problematic industry, um, and, and, and how that spiraled out within, but it wasn't predictable that anyone would succeed in getting him to resign. And after these artists, finally, the last straw was that these artists demanded their works removed. And that's when it happened. Had these artists done this in the beginning, I don't think it would have made a difference. It's that it happened in sequence with all, in, in, in kind of a cluster, with all of these other interruptions in these initial conditions. And so, so those small changes within, or small, uh, um, let me go back, because I want to use the exact word to just like make the connection. So this future as a forecast, the future wasn't able to be forecasted the way that Warren Candress might have imagined it, but all of these little interruptions in the, in the initial conditions were the things that made the change. Now, is everything healed and stopped and whatever? No, this was one step, but I think a useful example in kind of thinking through how the changes in those initial conditions can happen increment or not maybe not incrementally, because I, I don't really believe in an incrementalism, but I think by, um, you know, by creating disruptions uh, in various ways, this type of change can happen. And so uh, I think that what, ha what attracted me when I was writing uh, about the lightning field and, and also what still attracts me to these, um, to these ideas that surround chaos theory is that they create this imaginary for change that is with that, that where, where the change can happen in within these patterns that we know we live in, that are dominant patterns. And it creates an imaginary for how the very, very large and the very, very small are connected to one another. They're similar. They are not dissimilar. And they create a space, um, th these repeated patterns create a space that once we're we're inside one another and the next, we can disrupt, we can create uh, moments of change, small moments of change, that then echo one another, just like um, in the uh, image of the of the of the butterfly effect, where each of the the aperiodicity of the butterfly itself is because of those 
interruptions. That is what causes the change. And they echo one another into infinity. And so that is the piece of um, hope that I offer to you today. <laughs>